Bonsoir à tous, bienvenue dans le Midweek Live du 26 juillet 2023. Et je suis ravi ce soir, je me suis euh, jeté un défi un petit peu, parce que c'est la première fois dans cette émission, pour ceux qui nous suivent, que je vais recevoir un groupe euh, qui ne parle pas français. <rire> et, et ça fait un moment que je n'ai pas pratiqué un anglais qui commence à être un petit peu rouillé. Mais j'ai un, un, un très très grand plaisir à, à recevoir ce soir Ice Age, euh, groupe de, de rock progressif venu euh, directement de New York. On est avec Josh et Doug euh, de Ice Ice Age donc, et on va discuter de Wave of Loss and Power, le nouvel album du groupe, après 22 ans sans nouvel album, euh, ils sont de retour, et avec un nouvel album de rock progressif qui, à mon avis, devrait en surprendre plus d'un. Vous connaissez le concept de l'émission, j'envoie mon jingle, et on se retrouve tout de suite après. Hi, it's a real pleasure to have you tonight. Uh, 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 how was your day, guys? Josh, can you hear us? Yeah, now I can. Sorry about that. A little <laughs> having some worries. software issues. I, I was just wondering how was your day. Going great so far. Yourself? Thanks for having us. It's it's a pleasure to have you tonight in in this show. Uh, I was explaining uh, as the usual people looking to this show that uh, for me it's a challenge because uh, you are the first uh, non-French band I received here, and uh, and uh, as I explained to you to mates, uh, it, my English is a little bit rusty, so excuse me for that. No, it sounds perfect. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks a lot. We, we're here to speak about Waves of Loss and Power. Uh, it, it, it was a hard time for me uh, on the internet to find to find info on, your, on the band. Uh, there's so much cross things all over. Uh, there's a Danish band called Ice Age, in one word. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I find info about uh, 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 a lapse of time where Ice Age were called so fractured. I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> Maybe you'll find <laughs> you, you'll explain it to me. Uh, for those who don't know you, uh, can you one or, or, or the other explain us and make a brief bi biography of the band? Sure. Well, again, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. Um, the band, you, you're correct. I mean, we had a very long break in between the last album, Liberation, which came out in 2001. And now, obviously, 22 years is a long time. So, uh, you know, between the time we released the last album and now, um, there is, as you said, another popular Danish band it's called Ice Age. There are actually some others, too. So, uh, you know, the, the name of the band, I guess, these days is a bit cliche. So uh, uh, I suppose that explains the confusion there. As far as the history, uh, Jimmy, the guitar player, and I, Jimmy Pappas, met uh, back in the late 80s in college. Um, and we both shared a, a love of, you know, heavy rock and um, progressive rock. And we started playing together. Uh, Hal joined us uh, shortly after that and uh, Doug a little later on. And um, <clears throat> we did two... Um, albums with the label Magna Carta, which uh, back in the late 90s was the uh, sort of the flagship label for this kind of music. Um, and uh, like I say, I mean, you know, we always prided ourselves on, on writing um, uh, melodic, but also very technical, uh, uh, expansive, uh, progressive songs with thoughtful lyrics. And, um, you know, we're just very lucky after this long break, as I mentioned, to be able to do it again. So it's an exciting time for us. It's really, really cool. Uh, to be honest, I didn't know anything of the band before uh, preparing the interview and uh, receiving your promo material. And uh, I, I, I'm still... Uh, it's, how, could, uh, how is it possible I can't hear anything from you before? I was wondering. <laughs> really. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you, you started the band uh, like a, a, an instrumental one uh, without, uh, without any singer for the beginning in 1991. 
1999 right. first album, as you you told. Uh, if you compare the first album to the way you work today, uh, what's the principal evolution on the way of composing and creating songs? Well, I think um, the you know it's been I mean it's it's been many decades. Uh, the evolution is a, is a constant process as a musician, as an artist, really of any kind. Um, you know, at first we were very taken with uh, technical prowess. You know, um, when we when we first heard, for example, when Dream and Day Unite, which was the first Dream Theater album back in 1989, we actually were, were friends with those guys. We all grew up in the same area. Uh, you know, we were blown away by it and very influenced by it. Um, and so it was all it was mostly at the beginning of the band about uh, playing ability sort of showing off, you know, when you're young, that's what you do. I think in general, the evolution of the band has been towards memorable melody uh, and also incorporating the, the technical prowess, quote unquote, uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, because that's sort of a requirement in progressive music. Um, so that element will always be there with this band. Uh, but really, over the years, it's it's been for us progressing towards Uh, as I say, melody and uh, thoughtful use of the notes rather than uh, fast, you know, shredding all the time. So that's the general direction of the evolution, I think. Hey, uh, often for the first album, it's a show time. You, you got to show what you can do and, and you put some exactly, exactly. <laughs> much and much things in it. <laughs> that's it. So it's, it's more mature to, to today. Uh, uh, about the, the recording techniques, uh, we were talking about you, maybe not a, a real a tech guy. Uh, how, how does it, how, how does it change, uh, the, the new tech stuff you have to today, uh, about, you know, uh, writing at home, uh, sending stuff to, uh, one and another? Uh, do you, do you use those things today or, or not? We do. We have. I mean, like, I, uh, when I joined the band, uh, everything happened with four people in the room. And we actually did a lot of recording of, of rough jams directly to tape, right? So it was very organic. Whereas now, um, you know, we might record a snippet of something using an iPhone memo file and share it in a group text. And, you know, we can send each other wave files. We can send each other session files on, uh, you know, or recording software, um, we can record individually, we, we can even write virtually now uh, using a software called Jamulus, where uh, if one person is able to host a physical server uh, on location, everybody else can log into the server and the software can uh, make it uh, available to you to adjust for the buffering and for the distance to your router and the distance geographically. So all of those tools um, that are available to us, and especially during the pandemic, because we were writing during the pandemic and lockdown, that all became absolutely crucial to our process. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, where does a song comes from in Ice Age? Uh, what's the inspiration? Is it a, a, a guitar riff? Uh, is it coming from drums? Uh, wh when does it start and from what? I think generally speaking, um, it either starts with a guitar riff that Jimmy comes up with and we just all jam and uh, uh, the drum parts happen, the bass parts happen, um, either that or I'll have a piano part. And Jimmy will start playing to that, and then uh, we work it up that way. I generally, it, most of the music uh, starts with a guitar piece or a piano or keyboard piece, uh, and then we go from there. That's generally how it's it's worked uh, with us. You know, we'll come, Jimmy or I will come in with sort of set ideas, and then the other guys will chime in, and we'll work on the arrangements and, and change things based on the ideas that that, that Doug and Hal have, and uh, we sort of work it up from there. 
Okay. I, I, I've got someone uh, on the chat who said that the new album is fantastic. Power and Melody all together can stop playing in it. What a return. His name is Marco G. Visser. Maybe, maybe you know him. Sometimes on chat, you, you, you have personal, uh, personal people, you know. <laughs> but, uh, it, it's quite a compliment. 20 years after, what a return. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, it, it, we're so gratified. The, the response has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for that, for that comment. It mean, it, I mean, it means a lot to us because that, this is why we do this. I mean, we do this for the fans who, who've been with us for more than two decades and, um, That was, as I say, one of the really gratifying things about coming back after so long was that we realized how many people were out there who loved the band and were waiting for new material. And it, it's really been overwhelming. I don't know, Doug, if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, it's whereas 20 years ago plus, we were in somewhat of a, a siloed universe of not really knowing uh who was out there that loved the band and there, w there wasn't the facility for them to really interact with us the way they can now with all of the social media platforms. So that's a big difference. And as Josh said, this overwhelming response from all over the world of everyone being so excited that the band is back, uh, embracing the new album, and you know just wanting to reach out to us and talk about the fact that they grew up listening to the great divide or liberation and how much those songs have meant to them how much the lyrics have meant to them you know i've had i've had people um where english isn't their first language and they'll be asking me i, I can't find the lyrics to this song and i really need to know the second verse of perpetual child from the great divide could you please clarify you know these this stands it to me and so like i mean that's that's incredible I, i was about to talk about it some people waited 22 years to have the second part of paper to child <laughs> uh, uh, the, on this last album there's eight songs uh for you which one was uh, the hardest one to 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 to, to to made in a, in globally you know from starting it to finishing the recording Oh, that's a tough one. Um, <clears throat> on this record, I would probably say uh, to say goodbye part five, which is the, you know, in the progressive tr tradition, you know, we of course have a continuation of a lot of the, the musical ideas and lyrical motifs that were on the first two albums. That uh, song was one of the first things we started writing together uh, when we got back together as a band and started writing uh, a few years back. Um, I had a bunch of piano ideas, um, uh, but it took a while to fit them all together. And then I started to realize that this really would work well as a continuation of the original to say goodbye saga, so to speak. Um, you know, I think s sort of, uh, these parts come to you as a musician and, um, subconsciously, I think it was always intended to be a continuation, but as I worked out the parts and worked on the song more and more lyrically and musically, it became clear that that's what it was. But um, the interplay between the piano and the heavy guitars in that song was something that Jimmy and I had to really uh, work out uh, because I think that's one of the things that distinguishes us from a lot of the other sort of heavy progressive bands is the interplay between the piano and distorted heavy like metal guitars. I don't think there are a lot of bands that do that. So uh, working those parts out was a little bit, some of the parts are pretty intricate and it was, it was an interesting challenge for us. So I would, I would say that song was uh, uh, probably took the longest to, to work out, to put together. And the easiest one. Oh, I don't know. What do you think? Doug? <laughs> I mean, I, well, um, <clears throat> I don't know if I would, easy might not be a word that comes to mind for me because it, there's, there's so much, care um, and passion that we all put into coming up with parts you know like like Josh said you know Josh and Jimmy are, are really the principal architects um, when it comes to the writing and then you know Hal and I will contribute our aspects 
Um, but I guess uh, I would say that uh, Float Away just felt very natural um, in, in the way that song came together. And that's actually, um, you know, that was when that song was was written. You know, was uh, I was really new to to being part of the of the band, you know, initially. So um, yeah, I would probably say "Float Away." Uh, you know, if I had to say it from a level of difficulty standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that. Sorry, I didn't mean. To say that. No, I was just going to, I agree. I think, you know, Float Away and, and All My Years are sort of shorter form songs. We like to uh, show that in addition to the long progressive epics, we can write sort of concise, melodic songs with sort of a more normal structure. Uh, so I, I would say probably those two. Um, but, you know, none of it is hard or difficult for us. It's such a joyful process. This creative process is, I mean, that's the reason we do it, you know, it's because we just love writing together. And, it, it, you know, without, you know, we've been talking about me and Jimmy being the genesis of the songs and all of that, but without the, contrib the specific contributions of Hal and Doug, there would be no Ice Age, you know, but it's all a very joyful uh, process. So uh, I think in general, the longer songs are quote unquote harder to finish because there are so many parts and it's so intricate. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, like I say, it's a it's a it's a really exciting and joyful joyful process. Okay, we were talking about tech uh, just before. Uh, what's today the balance uh, for you between tech and uh, uh, playing live uh, with uh, with your mates? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, I uh, I think you know as far as uh, playing live, that's something we're still working on because we have not, uh, we have not played a gig as a band in, what is it, 17 years, something like that. So it's been a very long time. So we're still working to get that together. Uh, as far as tech, I am very old school. Uh, I, you know, all of my keyboard, well, not all, but 80% of my keyboards are vintage gear. They're all, you know, keyboards that I was, that I was playing back on the first, a couple of albums, you know, so I'm, I'm not the best with the tech. I'm trying to learn. I don't know, Doug, what do you think? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, for to Ice Age to sound as like us organically, um, it's very old school. You know, it's get in a room, get in our instruments, plug in and play. So I don't feel like um, for us to be true to that authenticity, there's a lot um, of new technology that needs to come into it. Like I said uh, about the all of the recording aspect, that's where we've really adapted and where um, we've embraced all of the new technology. And also, you know, social media, um, you know, We were on every single platform uh, that you can imagine, including even uh, the new meta platform that's similar to uh, Twitter. Like we're we're on every everywhere that you know that you could interact with the band, that the band and share um, you know updates and share snippets. Um, you know every every single that we released uh, leading up to the the album. And the videos that we did, so I, I think on that side of things, we fully embrace technology. But as far as how we play and how we write and sing, um, it's really the same as it's always been. Yeah, that's true. It's a mix between uh, 2000s and uh, 2023. Yes, that's it. Okay, uh, you, you were talking about videos uh, just just before. Uh, there's a clip for River Flow, uh, which is out for this new album. Uh, is there any plans for any other song? 
Uh, let's see, we did a, a video for the first single Needle's Eye uh, and a visualizer for Together Now. And the, the, the most recent release was uh, River Flow. Uh, we don't have any plans at the moment to do another one, but it's something um, in the next uh, couple of months we'll probably discuss. We'd have to sort of uh, figure out which song we'd want to do, but there are no plans at the moment. Okay, <laughs> but it's uh, something you're, 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 you're thinking about. Yes, absolutely. Okay, it's it's uh, uh, it, it might be uh, quite difficult to adapt to this uh, this new way of uh, communications uh, where you from where you 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 went. Uh, what what's for you the, the biggest difficulties uh, today with all those kind of stuff? Technical? Uh, Te well, no, maybe may, no, not technical. Uh, in fact, you, you know, today to be a band, uh, most people oh, say see. you have to 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 get out something uh, every two months uh, or every month. You you got to 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 give some fresh stuff. Uh, is it something you're you're cool with, or, or is it something quite difficult? I think we recognize that uh, people have short attention spans, but the good thing about this style of music that you know Ice Age gets associated with being in the prog realm is that there's also an understanding that you know to write music the way Ice Age writes you know is not something that happens overnight. You know, it's something that takes time and it, it has to be done thoughtfully. And so I think that there's a certain amount of understanding that, you know, if we were doing three minute pop songs, it would be easy to, to keep that flow of content happening. But, you know, when you have 15 minute epics um, and they're not just epics in the sense of, okay, this is long and there's a lot going on. You know, there is so much uh, care uh, and heart put into arranging and, and crafting this material, and that takes time. And for us, it's all about quality over quantity in the sense that, you know, we know we wouldn't put anything out that didn't meet our own personal standards of what we think has to be good enough to stand up against those three albums. And so uh, we, we recognize that, yes, uh, as you said, there's that, uh, you know, a certain kind of understanding that like people want more content, they, you know, um, and, you know, we, there are ways that we can, uh, we can serve that, you know, with like maybe doing something like this, you know, like doing a, a live conversation like you is, a way to give people content and connect with the band and learn about the band. Um, and like Josh said, you know, I'm sure there's going to be more music down the road and hope with more music, that would mean, you know, hopefully more videos like what we've done. Mm -hmm. See, this last album went out on the 10th March from this year. Uh, is, is the fourth one uh, already in progress? Uh, it is actually, we have, uh, a bunch of music, um, that, uh, sort of, we didn't fully finish or, uh, fully arrange or fully work up, uh, that we considered putting on ways of loss and power. So we still have a bunch of material, uh, that's maybe halfway finished and, uh, you know, we're always coming up with new ideas and new parts and, um, you know, the great joy of being in this band is working with these guys and writing with these guys. Like I said, it's such a, it, it, it's so exciting for us that um, uh, I think, you know, shortly we're going to start working on the next record. And, um, uh, you know, we're all, we're all looking forward to that. There are a lot of ideas bubbling around and we're, uh, we're sort of ready to go. So yeah, we, we anticipate working on new music uh, very shortly. Okay, I, I'm not so surprised. Most of times, bands uh, release an album knowing what they want to do for the, the next one. 
That's it. It's it's quite cool because uh, the last two songs from from this album are, are uh, a kind kind frightening for people uh, to say goodbye. It's I think it's not time right now to say goodbye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. That's interesting. You say that the the title to say goodbye is very evocative, and it it is it is frightening in a sense. Um, I don't know. What do you want to say about that, Doug? Oh, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's a clever uh, comment. I actually didn't really think of it that way. I thought of it. No, more, that's a really good way to put it. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. um, you know, I, like you said, I thought of it more in the spirit of the continuation of the parts that came before and, you know, and, and, and a, a suite unto itself, um, you know, which recently there was a, uh, Uh, a U.S. based uh, radio programmer that actually did that, actually played the entire To Say Goodbye suite in sequence, which uh, was really cool to, to be part of. Yeah, that was interesting that he did that. And, um, it, you know, I don't know that I ever done that myself, listen to the, all of the parts in sequence, but you can hear the evolution of the band. And again, it is interesting that you say it's frightening because that saga, those songs are examining different uh, aspects of loss. You know, as, as we get older, you know, we lose our childhood, we lose people and family, we lose dreams and ambitions. Uh, life is a, in many ways, is a progression of different kinds of losses. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that is a frightening thing. Uh, but, you know, one of the one of the challenges for me is to, is to, is to write lyrics that are provocative that made people think about life in maybe a different way or sort of force people a little bit to think about things that they're not so comfortable thinking about. Uh, and this is one of the, you know, the reasons I love lyricists like Neil Peart, for example, he was, I consider myself a, you know, a, a student of his writing and he, he sort of worked in that way. Um, uh, you know, he want, he wanted to challenge the reader, the listener in that way. And, Um, so that's one of the things I strive for when I'm doing the lyrics. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we are, uh, it's, it's about uh, half an hour we're talking, uh, and I have a tradition in the midweek live. Uh, it's to pass a little quiz to my quest, to my guests. Uh, uh -oh. it, nothing complicated. Uh, I'm going to ask you to associate an artist, an album or song, uh, with a stage of life. A stage of life we, we all come through. Everything past them. For the first one, I'll ask you to go back to your early childhood. Uh, is there a nursery rhymes, a lullaby, or a song that you asked your parents over and over? Oh, that's a, that's, that's a difficult one. Uh, I mean, what, what's, what's coming to mind for me is really not not back to that uh, that young, but I guess more when I, when I think about music, I think about like the first music that really struck me uh, as a young person. You know, when I was about seven years old, I discovered Kiss, uh, the band Kiss, and I was just obsessed and fascinated with like these larger than life cartoon character superhero type guys that also played this rock music. Um, and, you know, like I went through a phase for a few years where like I was just obsessed with them until I discovered the Beatles. Um, so that's probably like my earliest musical memory would be the Kiss, would be Kiss and then the Beatles. Okay. I I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's your soon. <laughs> No, I would say in thinking about it, um, you know, my parents um, had sort of different musical influences. My father was very classical music oriented and I was trained to play classical piano. So, you know, I'm very familiar with that sort of thing. And I, my father would listen to opera. He would listen to uh, uh, Bizet and Puccini and uh, 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 Wagner and things like that. And that sort of gave me that sense, that feel of drama in music. And uh, my mother 
had like Simon and Garfunkel albums and Harry Chapin albums lying around. So more of the folk music side of things. And I think uh, that's really uh, from my musical childhood, that's sort of, I, I regard those as sort of uh, early influences. Those are the things I remember sharing with. And, you know, I would always ask my mother to put on that Simon and Garfunkel record because it always interested me as a young child. Okay. Well, for the next one, when you enter uh, junior high school, what's in your Walkman? Oh, that's easy for me. Um, it's, it was like Rush Signals um, was uh, a, a biggie for me. When I heard that album, uh, something switched in my brain because um, I realized that heavy progressive music could also have that keyboard element. And as a keyboard player, that was exciting for me. Um, I had also heavier stuff. Uh, you know, I, I was listening to, you know, Iron Maiden, like Power Slave and, and, and the early Dio albums. And, you know, that stuff was on heavy rotation as well in my Walkman. <laughs> and you, Duke? Junior high school for me, I went through a big obsessive phase uh, with Led Zeppelin and the Doors. Mm. Um, You know, I, I had I had also become aware of Rush and also the Signals album um, around that time. I didn't I, I hadn't fully discovered Rush just yet. I was very much in, in, in this classic rock renaissance. And, you know, it was I was discovering all this music that, you know, that was associated with bands that no longer existed. And it was it's. It's, I think it's, a, it's an interesting um, dynamic when you're discovering a band and becoming a fan of a band that exists and is active and, you know, is still making new music and still touring. Whereas, like, you know, at that point, I was obsessed with all of this music of bands that no longer existed for different reasons. You know, band members no longer, uh, you know, John Bottom was gone by then. Uh, you know, uh, J uh, Jim Morrison was already gone. So yeah, that, that's the phase that I was in at that time. It was very classic rock oriented. Okay, so same question, but when entering high school? Ooh, uh, let's see, more Iron Maiden and more Rush. Uh, <laughs> actually, uh, when I got it, uh, a friend of mine in high school introduced me You know, in high school, I got more into like uh, Black Sabbath and I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Black Sabbath, um, you know, really the entire catalog. But um, I started with the two uh, studio albums that the two original studio albums that were done with Dio uh, because I was such a Dio fan. And I, I had been listening to the Dio solo stuff before those uh, Black Sabbath albums, which came earlier. And that sort of led me into the early Sabbath period from like, you know, 1969 to 1978. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I was heavily into like volume four and uh, sabotage and Sabbath bloody Sabbath. Uh, I was a big Sabbath guy uh, in high school. In addition to, as I say, I mean, Rush was always a, a constant presence. Um, and I started getting into, um, Uh, more progressive rock, like Yes and Genesis. Uh, Kansas was a was a, another huge influence on me, which I started listening to in high school. So that's what comes to mind as far as high school. Okay. For me, I went through another offshoot phase in high school where I just became uh, really fixated and obsessed on uh, the blues. And um, I discovered this record label called Alligator Records at the time. And it was an indie label and they had signed Johnny Winter. And I just like, I became completely obsessed with like early ZZ Top, the early ZZ Top records from the 70s, Johnny Winter, Rick Derringer. Um, yeah, I just like, I, I couldn't get enough of it. And I, I it's funny, I. I remember in my senior year of high school, on one night, uh, I saw Johnny Winter and, and a trio uh, perform in New York City, out, an outdoor show at Pier 84. Uh, 
and you know, I was like the first song <laughs> comes out and he just solos for like 10 minutes before he even steps up to the microphone. And you know, with like just, just a power trio and he just is destroying it. So good. And then the following night, I went to see Motley Crue and White Snake <laughs> at Madison Square Garden. So, um, you know, that's, I, you know, I, I had that blues uh, obsession. And then, you know, I, I really loved White Snake too in high school and not just, uh, not just like the big self titled album that everyone kind of focuses on, but. The, the earlier White Snake stuff with Mel Galley. Oh um, man, those albums are great. Yeah, I mean, just and uh, you know, and that led me down the path of discovering Deep Purple, and uh, and you know, just like all of that blues rock, but then you know the the blues, and then as it got integrated into heavier music, like Josh said, discovering Kansas, Deep Purple. Um, and Van Halen. Van Halen was a was was a huge huge part of my high school um, soundtrack of my life. It was like just loving Van Halen. Okay, okay. For this next question, I remind you that we're talking about music. The first exchange uh -oh. of fluid with another human being. First exchange of. First exchange of fluid with another human being. <laughs> That's an expert. How We're talking about music. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm like, how, how, is the, how are we putting this in context with music? I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, hmm. <laughs> it might be the, yeah, first, you, the first girl you kiss. Whatever, whatever you, it is you want. I mean, I remember that moment. A thousand percent. I know who it was and where I was. Um, and I, I can tell you what I was listening to um, right at that time. I don't know if it was that exact moment, but it was Doug brought up Van Halen. Uh, Fair Warning and Moving Pictures were the soundtracks of that particular summer. Um, now I don't. We 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 may have shared fluids. I don't think we necessarily shared musical taste. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Doug, <laughs> good luck, man. Uh, well, for me, the 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 album there's, there's two albums that come to mind for that that summer for me, uh, which is Operation Mindcrime by Queensrÿche and uh, Injustice for All by Metallica. Like those two albums. That's came out. Yeah. <laughs> those two <laughs> albums came out around the same time. And I was obsessed, you know, that was, you know, I was completely blown away by Queensryche. Um, and especially the Rage for Order album is actually my favorite Queensryche album of all time. It will, oh, like, you know, I, I prefer that album to anything they did before and anything they did after. Um, I, yes, you know, it really was, it really was uh, amazing. And uh, yeah, that's- Great make that music. <laughs> well, it's funny that you said the thing about the musical taste because, you know, I definitely, uh, you know, having such very specific and particular taste of music that was, you know, a lot of which I wouldn't consider to be mainstream, especially as my taste developed and I got into more obscure stuff. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it's not easy to find someone that... Uh, is going to tolerate, you know, <laughs> listening to uh, screaming in digital. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, a hundred times in a row. <laughs> You're right. Yes. Yes. Okay. And then one five six. Okay. Yeah, I mean, prog pro progressive rock is uh, not uh, chick music. <laughs> uh, generally, like you know, I, I went to a uh, Rush concert with my wife for the first time, uh, you know, some years ago. And she was amazed. Usually when she, she said, usually when she goes to a concert, the line for the, for the women's bathroom is the, the one that's a mile long. At a Rush concert, it's the line for the men's room that's a mile long. And she had no weight at all. So, <laughs> you know, that sort of, I thought was a good metaphor for the, uh, 
the balance of, of male and female uh, with progressive rock. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's quite a good one. F finally, an easier <laughs> one. The last song you listen to today. Well, uh, Doug will have to handle that one because it's 7.43 in the morning where I am at the moment. <laughs> so I haven't even... <laughs> right. <laughs> no. uh, I can tell you what the last thing I listened to last night was, and, you know, I, I'm a massive devotee of this band, Spock's Beard. Uh, I was listening to uh, the Five album. Uh, I just, I love that band. And I just, they're my favorite band at the moment. I just think they're brilliant in all their iterations. But that's the last thing I listened to. Uh, so for me, I actually, I stumbled across a news item about uh, an acetate promo version of the album Diver Down by Van Halen that had a different cover and some of the song titles were placeholder song titles. They didn't even have final titles on this version that's uh, resurfaced. And so like, because I read that article, you know, while I was doing some work this morning, of course I had to put Diver Down on. And uh, it's one of those albums that gets a lot of criticism because it's so short and there's so many cover songs on it. Um, but the, the original songs that are on there are, Little guitars. Oh my God, right? Yeah. I mean, secrets. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of songs on there that are off the beaten path of like what a lot of, you know, typical Van Halen fans would expect that are just amazing. And uh, yeah, so I listened to probably like half of the Diver Down record early this morning. Okay. Never get sick of it. Okay. In, in the last 10 years, is there a, a progressive band that blown you? And, and if it is, which one? Um, I'm, you mean in the last 10 years of our personal evolution or you, you mean a newer band? Now, in your personal evolution, last 10 years, in your personal evolution. Again, it's an easy answer. Uh, it's, it's Spock's beard. Um, I think uh, that Neil Morris is a, is a genius, uh, and he's so prolific. Um, and uh, I got very heavily into the, the, uh, the Neil Morris years of Spock's beard. Um, and I know those albums backwards and forwards. And uh, I think, you know, Rio Rakimoto's... Uh, Hammond playing is so unique and so interesting. And those guys are just incredible and very unique band. But, you know, I guess that was a little more than 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, I've gotten really into their recent catalog, the, um, uh, when Nick DiGorgilio became the lead singer. And then more recently, uh, when Ted Leonard took over, uh, those are just wonderful, great, varied albums as well. And I sort of, I've sort of immersed myself Uh, in that catalog, you know, the, the, the material that they've been putting out over the last 10 years or so. So that's what I would say. There's three bands for me that I think about that what I would say would be like significant to answer your question. One of them is called Jolly. They're actually from New York. They're really interesting, progressive, uh, and, and very atmospheric um, in their approach. Um, and... Porcupine Tree, um, especially once Gavin Harrison joined the band, you know, with let's say from like the Dead Wing era on, once they got a heavier, um, uh, I, I really love Porcupine Tree. And then also Pain of Salvation is another band that um, I first discovered them actually around the time that I joined Ice Age. And then Pain of Salvation went through this weird period where they were trying to be not proggy but more uh kind of straight ahead almost almost classic rock and then i feel like they continue to evolve and they kind of found a balance between the two and they're doing stuff that's really still interesting and uh so yeah those would be the three yeah that's a the pain of salvation is a great band that That opening uh, on One Hour by the Concrete Lake is something that's always floating around in my brain. It's such a classic prog, like powerhouse. I love that band. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. We, we were talking about live uh, uh, just before. Uh, the last live you, you had together what is in uh, 24? Uh, the last, I, I, I think it was uh, 2006, I think was probably the last um, time we actually played together as a band. And that was in the Soul Fractured iteration of the band, which, uh, which you mentioned before. Yeah, so that it's it's been quite a quite a while. But uh, I think you decided to re- to 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 reform the band uh, when you played for another time together uh, at a barbecue. Can you That's tell right. can, yeah. can you tell us about that? <clears throat> yeah, I mean um, Hal, the drummer, Hal Aponte, uh, drummer extraordinaire, had us all over uh, for a barbecue at his house. And, um, you know, we had always been in touch. It's not like we hadn't seen each other or talked to each other, but, you know, we hadn't gotten together all of us in a while. And he told us to bring our instruments, you know, so, uh, we all did. I set up a keyboard in his, uh, living room there and we all just started jamming and Jimmy already had, uh, the the riffs, um, that were the beginning parts of perpetual child part two. Uh, he sort of brought that with him that day and we started jamming and it was, you know, it was obvious that we were going to continue doing this. And I think it's something we all wanted to do and had been looking forward to doing for, for many years since we stopped playing together. Uh, yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, that barbecue was, a was a big moment, a big moment. And the, the next big moment is for September, September, uh, this year. Uh, well, you pay, you you will play to Pro Power USA. So yeah, that was the plan, um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, mm-hmm. we're we're not going to be doing Prog Power. Oh. Um, but um, you know, we're definitely uh, very much uh, an active entity as a band. And, you know, we are going to, we're like Josh said earlier, we were already working on new music um, and, you know, writing for, you know, what will hopefully be the next album. And as far as, you know, live, you know, we're dead. That's Josh also indicated earlier. It's something that we still need to work towards. Um, You know, it's, uh, you know, playing music um, of this style, you know, that requires, uh, you know, a lot of time. Again, it's not three-minute pop songs. Uh, you can't just get in a garage uh, and, you know, go through everything once and then say, all right, let's play live. So there's a lot of work and a lot of time involved. And um, so, you know, it's something that we're striving for and, and uh, hoping to do. Um, but it's just not going to happen in September. But, you know, we're still very much... Uh, uh, an active band and entity. Okay. I just want to add, um, you know, that we're really disappointed that we had to cancel Prog Power. I mean, we were all really excited about it, but, you know, we're, we're no spring chickens at this point. And, you know, in addition to the, the, the cost issues and the logistical issues, one of the guys in the band had a pretty serious surgery a couple months ago. And, um, you know, it, it, in the interest of uh, his health, we, we felt that we really couldn't move forward. He needed some time to recover. Mm-hmm. So that we kind of lost a couple months. So we had been rehearsing consistently for it. Um, but, you know, life happens. Uh, so, you know, moving forward, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get that together as soon as we can. Okay, because uh, yeah, uh, I've got someone in the chat who's, uh, who's telling us that the band is amazing. And they, he asked if you will come in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> we we are talking about coming in France. Please do that for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, thank you so much for the comment. I mean, it, it, it again, it, this is why we do it. Um, you know, we do it for the fans, and it, it means so much to to us to hear those kinds of comments. And yeah, I mean, the last time we played in Europe was was Headway in um, in two thousand four. So I, I mean, we would love to get to Europe again. I mean, that's a real that's a real aspiration for us. I, I would love to get something together. In France, we have one festival uh, called Ready for Prague Festival, uh, which happened eight years. It's the, f- the fifth year this year uh, in near Toulouse. And uh, this year, the, uh, the headliner is Free Kitchen. And uh, 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 
That's it. And uh, I, I'll have an interview in September with uh, people who, who make this festival and I talk about you. <laughs> I, I, I made a place for you. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. Oh, thank you. Uh, how, how do you prepare uh, for live? Uh, is, is it something you, you work in uh, how to present uh, shows to, to people or not yet? In special effects, uh, scenographies, uh, those kind of stuff. I mean, that that's not something that I feel like we have been focused on the production aspect of it uh, for, for Ice Age 2023. I think it's more just about, again, the organic nature of the four of us in a room playing together. Like Josh said, you know, we... we We, we love to play together and just getting us in a room, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of laughs and a lot of hard work on the music. Um, Josh could speak to this better than, than I, but I feel like I heard some stories about during the monolith days that <laughs> there was some stage production stuff that you guys incorporated. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, yeah, we did. We had uh, we had a uh, back in the, when we first started playing live shows before I had uh, taken singing lessons with Tony Harnell. And, you know, I didn't really consider myself a singer at that point, And we were still auditioning people. We did instrumental shows in order to make it more interesting. We had uh, homemade uh, flash bombs. We had a pyro. We had a, a slideshow that would go on behind us. It was pretty cool. It was pretty interesting. So, yeah, no, the visual aspect of live is something um, that, that's really important. Um, and that's something, you know, we certainly would focus on. Okay. Is there a, a team around the band uh, to, to work with you and uh, this kind of stuff, like booking uh, or, or anything else? Or are you on your own? Hmm. We, we've been on our own, even like when, when I joined the band, um, and at the time this was literally just before Liberation came out. Um, the band has always been very, uh, you know, self-contained as far as operations and management. So the, the team is the four of us, and each of us has different things that we bring to the table, skill set-wise, to fill those gaps um, in order to make things happen. And that was one of the things um, originally uh, when we uh, – decided to take a break, uh, you know, that's obviously one of the discouraging things about the music business is, you know, when we were on Magna Carta, we were so very lucky and excited to be on that label because there are so many great talented bands on that label, but most of us uh, could not really get financial or touring support uh, uh, from the label. You know, I know that Uh, we had tried to get onto some some European tours and even some domestic tours, you know, as an opening act. And it was, a, you know, sadly, especially with a niche kind of music, mm -hmm. uh, you need with the niche market that Prague is in it. It's, it's very hard to uh, to get financial backing for that kind of thing. And that's one of the things that was uh, discouraging back in the day and sort of led us to hang it up for a little while. Mm -hmm. And today the situation is um, much more difficult after COVID it's crisis. More difficult today. That's correct. It. Yeah, it's much more difficult today. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know we have to work towards, but uh, it's a real challenge, uh, mostly from a financial perspective. Okay, it's the main problem for sure. Uh, guys, it's uh, it's almost an hour we are we are talking. Uh, Uh, it, it was a real, real pleasure to have you tonight. Uh, Thanks so much for having us, man. It really means a lot to us. I really appreciate it. it it's really, really cool. I, I, I wanted to know, uh, in fact, I discovered the band because you're working with Stotsis Promotion uh, with Noemi. Uh, yeah. how, how does it happen? I'm pretty sure that uh, Solstice was secured by... Our, our record label. So Ken Golden uh, runs Sensory Records and uh, and and Laser, uh, and those are his labels, his imprints. And so he uh, has been, you know, kind enough to facilitate all of you know the marketing and promotion side of things. 
which includes Solstice. Uh, and, you know, he's got those relationships on your side of the pond uh, in, in order to make things like this talking to you possible. And so uh, we love Ken. And, uh, you know, Ken is a real true audiophile and true music fan and a real prog music guy. You know, you, you have to studio, ask as in Prague. Prague. Yeah, he's like the Sultan of Prague. Uh, <laughs> You know, you, you just couldn't find someone that's like more immersed in that world and someone that's been a fan of the band back to the early days and, you know, a champion of the band even before he was involved with us uh, on the level that he is now. Yeah, we're very lucky to be working with Ken. He actually arranged for one of our one of our uh, seminal gigs, the Near Fest, uh, the first Near Fest Festival in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania in 1999. So we go way back with Ken and he's responsible for the for the promotional aspect of things. Okay, okay. It, it was real, real, real pleasure to have you tonight. Uh, I, I hope, really hope to see you in France soon. Uh, I, I, how would you like to, to end this emission? I just really want to give a heartfelt thank you uh, to the fans who've been with us for so long and who have supported this record and have been so overwhelmingly enthusiastic about the record. It's really been emotional for me personally, because um, uh, it, you know, this is why we do it. We, we want to share these ideas and this music with the fans and it's, it's all done for them. And uh, I, I just want to say thank you so much for, for the, the decades of support and enthusiasm. And thank you again for having us on. Well, thank you for this album, and, uh, and be sure we'll we'll be on the edge with Warm TV, and uh, we we each news you got, we uh, we we'll read it, we uh, we we'll diffuse it, we do whatever it uh, it needs to to bring you in France to play for us. It will be a real real cool moment. Awesome! Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, I say you good night, guys. Good night, good day. <laughs> Do you, we, <laughs> to me, it's good night too. <laughs> and uh, it will be a real, real, real pleasure to, 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 to see you in, in France. Me and the crowd, you on the stage. <laughs> I hope we can make it happen. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Good night. Et ben voilà, ce Midweek Live du 26 juillet s'achève euh, maintenant. Euh, J'espère que mon anglais un peu rouillé vous aura pas trop choqué pendant l'émission et que vous aurez pu comprendre globalement ce qui se racontait. Euh, je vais activer les options de sous-titrage sur les replays puisque le replay Facebook va être disponible dans quelques minutes. Donc euh, normalement, vous aurez accès à, à, à cette heure d'interview. Euh, de là, je reprends... Non, de trois, je vais y arriver. Je retransférerai, excusez-moi, j'ai des, des sauts d'écran en même temps. Donc je retransférerai le même replay euh, sur la chaîne YouTube de Warm TV. Je vous invite vraiment à aller écouter ce nouvel album d'Ice Age, Waves of Love and Power. C'est sorti le 10 mars 2023 via Sensory Records, The Last of Age. Euh, C'est Solstice Promotion qui s'occupe de tout ça pour la France. Euh, vraiment, foncez-y. L'album est, est, est une tuerie, est une tuerie sans nom. Et j'espère que vraiment, il y a des gens qui, qui programmeront euh, ce, ce groupe assez rapidement chez nous le Ready for Pro si vous m'entendez ce serait vraiment génial je ne vais pas vous laisser sans vous donner quelques indications euh, sur le groupe que je reçois le 6 septembre prochain parce que oui c'est effectivement c'est les vacances pour moi euh, et, 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 et du coup il n'y aura pas d'émission euh, pendant tout ce mois d'août euh, vous vous m'en excuserez ou pas hein, parce que de toute façon euh, c'est moi qui décide euh, et, et, et voilà et j'ai déjà mes invités donc euh, programmés euh, pour la rentrée ça s'appelle Me Against the World Matt W et c'est pas du tout yeah. le bon morceau que j'ai mis D'accord, alors autant pour moi, c'est pas du tout ça en fait. <rire> Mais je vais y arriver. Euh, c'est quand même fou ça. Euh, je vais y arriver. Donc, nos invités le 6 septembre prochain, c'est Me in the World pour la sortie d'un nouvel EP euh, dont on aura l'occasion de vous reparler assez rapidement. Et je vous laisse avec le clip de Save the World, le morceau officiel. <musique> 